you know, this sort of the improvements that we've seen over the past, uh, you know, couple of generations are not guaranteed to continue. Um, in some ways, today's retirees are better off financially than the people who are now in their, you know, mi middle ages. And so there are real concerns, I think, that, you know, the, the generations coming up, you know, people now in their 40s and 50s, are going to be in a much worse position when it comes to retirement than the generations that are now at 60 or 70 or beyond. Hello and welcome to Cambridge Forum, coming to you live via Zoom. I'm Mary Stack, the Executive Director, and today we're pleased to kick off part one of two programs devoted to looking at quality of life in our later years and some of the considerations that affect it. Today we're looking at retirement and beyond. What are the pros and cons of working later? What factors affect our decision? Part two, which will be recorded next Tuesday, will focus on all about Medicare and it's going to be a live hybrid event recorded at Cambridge Public Library. But back to today, our guest is sociologist, Dr. Beth Truesdale. She teamed up with Lisa Berkman, a fellow academic and director at the Harvard Center for Population and Development Studies. And they published a book called Overtime. It's a very provocative study of America's aging workforce and the future of working longer. Her book raises some disturbing questions about some key assumptions which we've made in this area many ill-founded, it would appear, which have thus dictated government policies. In addition to being a visiting scientist at Harvard, Truesdale is a research fellow at the W.E. Upjohn, Upjohn Institute for Employment Research. Welcome, Beth, joining us from Northern Ireland. Good evening. Well, thanks, Mary. It's a pleasure to be here. So before we get into a more in-depth analysis of the findings, Beth, perhaps you could explain to us why you wrote this book and why you thought it needed to be written. And then in doing so, tell us about the authors and why you thought a multidisciplinary approach was required for the subject. Yeah, thanks. So, I mean, I think it all starts with the idea that population aging really profoundly affects the future of work and retirement. I think that's been well understood. You know, the Americans are living longer on average than they did 50 years ago. People who live longer are gonna need income for more years of life. And so really the question is, where's that money gonna come from? And working longer, by which we don't mean like working later in the day, we mean working more years in the life. Working longer delayed retirement has become a standard policy response to population aging. In some ways, we might say it's become the standard st standard sorry, standard policy response to population aging. Um, and this is true not only in the US, but in most wealthy nations, which have raised their state pension ages. Here in the US, the Social Security full retirement age is in the process of rising from 55, sorry, 65 to 67. And there are people who argue that it should be older still, that it should be 70 or even older than that. So the whole working longer proposition, this idea, you know, live longer, work longer, retire later, it assumes that most Americans can indeed delay retirement. But really, the minute that you start to ask, OK, who's left behind, you see immediately that delayed retirement isn't going to be feasible for everyone. And this is really where over time the book, this project came from, was the realization that so much of the conventional thinking about working longer really relies on this kind of mental model of retirement. You know, the idea that people should delay retirement from age 65 to 67, or that they should delay from 67 to 69 or 70. Um, but that kind of thinking really leaves behind a, a surprisingly large proportion of Americans who are already out of the labor force or struggling to stay employed in their late 50s or early 60s, really, you know, not coming anywhere close to kind of mid to late 60s. So over time, 
um, really looks at who's left behind by the working longer policy solution. And it's a complicated topic. So we felt like we really needed perspectives from many different disciplines. So it's an edited book. Um, Lisa Berkman, my co-editor, and I recruited economists, sociologists, epidemiologists, psychologists. We've got a couple of political scientists, um, a really terrific group of experts who have all looked at the evidence in their areas and written chapters that um, look at, you know, that continue to push the boundaries of what we know about working longer. And what we really found out looking yeah, as we went through the process of doing this book is that many Americans are out of work in their late 50s or their early 60s for a whole bunch of different reasons. There's caregiving responsibilities, age discrimination, troubled local labor markets. What's it like to try to grow older in a place you know, where jobs are, are few and far between? Um, the effects of unexpected shocks like the COVID pandemic, um, poor health, unstable employment, a lack of jobs that meet workers' needs, all of these are factors in people retiring earlier than they might otherwise choose to do so. And we also wanted to focus on the fact that retirement security is a systemic problem as well as an individual one. So we tried to look at the broader context. During the past four years in the US, we've seen rising economic inequality, um, a diminishing worker voice or worker power, social security funding in need of updating, and overall, really, a, an increased shift of economic risk from government and business onto families and individuals. So that's really the sort of context for the book. And I wanted to just share a few findings from the book that I hope, to, hope helps to give a little bit of a flavor of kind of, uh, you know, some of, the, some of the key things that we came across. So first of all, I want to start with a story that's based on qualitative research in one of the chapters, some qualitative research with restaurant workers. It's a story of Jim, who's a waiter in his late 50s from Pennsylvania. And Jim said, restaurant work is a young man's game. It's hard to keep up with the physical demands. In his 30s at one of his jobs, Jim had to navigate two steps in the dining room and to save time, he tried to jump the steps to save that, those few seconds. And as he was racing to serve customers over all those years, this has left him with a chronic Achilles heel injury. And he says, I'm coming up on 60 years old. I don't know how much longer I can do my job. At my restaurant, everything is refillable. Bread, soda, soup, salad, pasta. It's like whack-a-mole. I just run my entire shift. So jobs like those that have physical demands that outstrip workers' health, that's one reason that Americans retire early. So I wanted to share this graph because this is a second reason that um, many people leave the labor force in their 50s or 60s, especially women. And that's that a lot of jobs don't do a very good job of uh, accommodating caregiving responsibilities. At some point in their 50s, about a third of women in the US will be providing intensive caregiving for parents or parents-in-law. And when I say intensive caregiving, I mean not just like helping with the errands on a weekend. I mean helping with daily tasks like eating and bathing and dressing. Um, and that's the kind of thing that it's very difficult often to make it work around your employment. And it does cut into the um, labor force participation of, of people who are doing that caregiving. What I've given you here in this particular graph is broken down by educational categories. So as you can see here, this is a case where the challenge falls more heavily on the more advantaged group. And that's really unusual. And one of the reasons I wanted to kind of pull this piece out in the graph, you can see that about 36% of college educated women provide caregiving for parents or parents-in-law at some point in their fifties. And that's compared to about 22% of women who have less than a high school degree. But the reason for the difference is tragic, really, and that's that less advantaged women are less likely to have parents who are still alive in those years than more advantaged women are. Thinking of caregiving responsibilities in terms of, you know, what does what does your job accommodate? And what does that mean for your labor force participation in these kind of run up to traditional retirement years? 
Um, most other rich nations have various forms of paid leave, um, sick leave, paid family and medical leave that might allow people to do some caregiving alongside of their um, employment. The U.S. doesn't have any laws on any of on any sort of paid leave, which means that those things are up to to employers and you know to the sort of individual relationship that em employees and employers have. This is one of the sort of key findings for me, really, of the whole book. What we're looking at here are graphs of employment rates for men on the left, for women on the right, um, from across the whole life course, from age 25 to age 70, broken down by educational categories, three educational categories here, college graduates, people with a high school diploma, and people with less than a high school degree. And I think for me, there are two things that are so striking about this graph. One is the size of the inequalities in employment that you see across the whole life course. The, the groups with the higher levels of education really have you know, much, much higher levels of employment all the way through the, their working lives. But the second thing that's really striking and maybe a bit more surprising is that you look at this gray band, the, the, get, the band between age 50 and age 60, where employment rates fall really rapidly during those years, and not only for the most disadvantaged groups. This was something of a surprise to me when I started this project. I thought that for more advantaged groups, we'd see lines that look more like that mental model we have of retirement, right? Work to 65 and then quit. But that's not how it works. Even among college graduates, you see this drop of roughly 20 percentage points in employment rates between ages 50 and 60. So this is a really important decade um, where a lot of people are leaving the labor force. After looking at that, that previous slide looks at you know, employment at a point in time all the way across the life course, but we also wanted to think about employment stability. So we looked at how many people are steadily employed, continuously employed all the way through their 50s, and we found that only about half of older U.S. adults were steadily employed all the way through their 50s. Um, about a third had some sort of intermittent employment pattern, and about 15% said they were never employed during their 50s. The reason that's so important is, when we're talking about working longer, is that those who, are, who lack steady employment in their 50s are much less likely to be working in their 60s. In this graph, what you see is that of those who were steadily employed in their 50s, about 80% were still working in their mid-60s. Of those whose employment was more intermittent, only about a third were still working in their mid-60s. And so what this says to me really is that focusing on delayed retirement beyond age 65 or you know 70 it really misses a major part of the story. And it's this part of the story that's happening in that decade of the 50s. One thing I think too, that's important to say is that most people who are leaving the labor force early are not retiring because they've made their fortunes. For most people, leaving paid work in their 50s just means that they end up having less to live on as they age. So while we're talking about how much you have to live on as you grow older, um, I wanna show you some numbers for social security benefits. Social security is, is the absolute backbone of the American retirement system. About nine in 10 adults over the age of 65 receive social security benefits. And for a really substantial minority, social security benefits are their only or their main source of retirement income. But what I think a lot of people don't fully realize is how modest social security benefits are because they weren't designed to be the social source of retirement income. They were designed to work in tandem with individual savings and with employer-based pensions. So the average social security benefit is around $20,000 a year. What you see in this graph are essentially some best case scenarios. If you earned the US average wage every year of your, of your entire working life, you'd receive around $20,000 a year in benefits if you began claiming at age 62, and less than 40,000 if you can wait 
up until age 70 to claim. If you earned the 10th percentile of income your entire working life, you'd receive about $10,000 in benefits if a year if you can claim at age 62, and just under $20,000 if you claim at age 70. And I call those best case numbers in the sense that they assume that you never take time out of the labor force, whether that's to care for family members, to take care of your own health, or to look for a new job, or things like that. So even as best case numbers, these are modest numbers, and these benefits are not enough to meet a basic budget for many household configurations in many areas of the country. So just a couple of points really to kind of you know, some of this overview of the of the book and the issues that we were trying to grapple with. One thing is to say that demographic changes are inevitable. America's aging, uh, you know, the, the population worldwide is aging, but policy responses are a choice. And work and retirement are two sides of the same coin. A lot of the time we talk about policies that affect the labor market, that affect workers, as if they were separate from policies that affect retirement security. But they're really not, because fundamentally you can't delay retirement if you don't have a job to delay retiring from. And what that means too is that policies to encourage delayed retirement really need to be addressing workers' needs a decade or more before traditional retirement ages. We can't wait until people are 65 or 67 and say, well, what would bring them back to the labor force? For many people, it'll be too late at that point. We really need to be looking at what's happening in people's lives much earlier. So those are just a couple of the, you know, some of the points that I wanted to, to raise about the book, some of the things we learned and why we thought we needed it. So I'll pause there. So I was quite taken aback. I'm sure a lot of people will be if they read the book, because there was a lot of myths busted in the pages for me. I mean, this simplistic notion, we're living longer, we can work longer. First, that implied a kind of choice that really doesn't exist for quite a sizable portion of the population. And you actually made a big point of emphasizing that there's a heterogeneity of the workforce, and that isn't really taken into account. So can you talk to us a bit more about that? I mean, the fact that people are looking now often to Social Security as being their main source of stable income um, for the latter part of their years, and it's so meager. How do we get to this point in history when I think back to the 50s when, you know, workers had these nice pensions and there was a sort of security attached to if you worked hard, you could expect to have a reasonable level of comfort in your retirement. That seems to have been lost along the way, would you say? It seems to be so become more skewed. You know, there's the people and the yachts from the two houses, and then there's the person saying, oh, I can't even think about retiring. Um, and I don't remember it being that skewed um, in the 60s and 70s. So you're raising a whole bunch of really important issues. Um, let me pick up on the, the question about, you know, what is retirement security look like now and how did we get to where we are? And I want to come back to the point you raised about heterogeneity and inequalities, because that's a really important part of the story too. So Ironically, we have to have a chapter in the book that shows how today's retirees, older Americans now, are actually better off financially than older adults were 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 60 years ago. So in many ways, things have got better. Poverty rates are lower among older adults now than they were 20 years, 40 years, 60 years ago. However, the rates of people who are you know, still living on very slim incomes are still remarkably high, and they're much higher in the US than they are in most other developed nations where um, you know, rates of poverty at all ages are, tend to be lower. So there are political choices that nations can and do make that affect how secure people's retirement is. 
one of the things that we were looking at in this book is the fact that you know this sort of the improvements that we've seen over the past uh you know couple of generations are not guaranteed to continue um in some ways today's retirees are better off financially than the people who are now in their you know mi middle ages and so there are real concerns i think that you know, the the generations coming up, you know, people now in their 40s and 50s are going to be in a much worse position when it comes to retirement than the generations that are now at 60 or 70 or beyond. So I think this, you know, the improvement is not guaranteed. Now, the future is not yet written. And the choices that we make as a nation today are going to have a lot of effect on what happens, you know, to those cohorts that are now in their 40s and 50s. But, you know, improvement is not guaranteed. And there are some suggestions that um, that the financial situation of people who are now middle aged is not as good as it needs to be. You couple that with rising economic inequality. And here's where the piece about heterogeneity becomes so incredibly important. So we've seen a rise in economic inequality, um, you know, over the past four decades or so. That means that you know there's a bigger spread in terms of you know who has more, who has less than there previously was. The bit, the more diverse people's experiences are, the more diverse their economic needs, the harder it is to make policy that fits you know the average, right? You need really policy that is going to um, not just be a sort of one size fits all, but something that really works. For, for a really broad variety of circumstances. Um, so when we're thinking about um, you know, those inequalities, we're looking at the economic inequalities and those have really tracked econ uh, inequalities in health and longevity as well. So you know, we look at, we have this sort of like, oh, everybody's living longer, we should all work longer. Well, the reality is not everybody is living longer. When you look at mortality rates and um, life expectancy, what's happened over the past uh, 10, 20, 30 years is that people with advantages by education, by income, have tended to, to live longer, to have lower mortality rates than previously. But people towards the bottom of the income or the educational distribution have not seen the same benefits. And in some cases, there are, depending on how you cut the groups, there are groups that are actually living less long, having higher mortality rates than 10, 20 years ago. So you have larger inequalities in life expectancy, as well as larger inequalities in financial situations. It, it makes it a lot harder to make policy that really works for work and retirement. So just talking about where the money comes from, that, that's a, that was a, amazing to me. So we have got this income inequality. We've got more millionaires. We've got more poor. The disparity is growing. That group is, is up here, insulated largely from what's going on for the reality of the people down here. But the Social Security income comes from taxes. And there's a ceiling, a cap. Is it $147,000? Yeah, that's right. right. Okay. So some, but that's the most that you're going to be taxed on for Social Security. So yeah. a millionaire is paying in the same amount into the pot than somebody that's earning $147,000. And then the people at the low end are paying largely into the pot because they need to, but they're not drawing off the pot in the same manner relating to their need. So who came up with that great figure and why has nobody revised it and, and said, oh, hey, this, this is something wrong with this? Yeah, so yeah, let's talk a bit about Social Security. Social Security is critical. Um, so Social Security is a pay-as-you-go program. That means that today's workers are paying in through their Social Security taxes and that revenue is what's going out to the people who are currently claiming benefits. Um, Social Security is progressive. What that means is that 
people who earn less during their careers, who are lower earners, get a higher percentage of their income back as social security benefits in, you know, when they, when they begin to claim benefits compared to people who earn more. So, you know, as a percentage, it's a good deal for lower earners. That's what it means that it's, you know, it's progressive. Um, in my view, that's a very good thing that is that it is progressive. Um, in absolute terms, though, in dollar terms, as you saw in that last, the final graph that I showed you, um, in absolute terms, people who earned less during their career receive a lower number of dollars in benefits than people who earned more during their career. And you're right about this um, cap in terms of how the how Social Security is set up. Um, there's a payroll tax cap is what it's called. It's $147,000 at present. And exactly as you said, it means that people who, you know, earn more than $147,000 in a year pay exactly the same amount of towards their payroll, their social security payroll taxes as somebody who earns, you know, right at that $147,000, $150,000 mark. Um, it, as top end income inequality has increased, the amount of income that's not taxed has increased also. It used to be that that payroll tax cap covered about 90% of income, and that has fallen over the years. So some of the policy suggestions that are out there um, suggest that one of the things that we could do is to raise or eliminate the payroll tax cap so that people who have, are, have, have higher incomes are paying the same proportion of their income towards Social Security as people who have lower incomes. Um, that lifting the payroll tax cap, that's important because let's talk about Social Security um, and the, you know, and what's out. happening, right? What's happening with Social Security over the next 10 years or so. So, um, and here's another sort of myth, I think we want to be a little careful with. So I think people have this notion sometimes that Social Security is going bust, it's going bankrupt. That is not exactly true. Social Security is facing a shortfall because it's a, you know, a pay-as-you-go system, as I was saying before, um, the income that's coming in has fallen because as the population ages, there are more people claiming compared to the number of people who are in the, you know, kind of the middle of their working years and paying in. So that's caused a, a shortfall for Social Security. In the years where there were sort of, you know, bumper tax crops because we had a younger population, Social Security built up a trust fund. So when you hear about the Social Security Trust Fund, that's what it is. It's this, you know, sort of money that is set aside for Social Security. Um, now, the Social Security Trust Fund, you know, as that gets drawn on to pay out the um, benefits that today's um, older adults are receiving, that Social Security Trust Fund decline, de decreases. And it's currently on track to be exhausted around the mid 2030s, 2035 or thereabouts. And if Congress does nothing, when we hit that point and there's no more trust fund, then outgoings have to be limited to the current revenues. And that means that um, all benefits would be cut across the board by about 20% if Congress does nothing bef to fix this before that happens. So it doesn't mean that social security is going bust. It means that it's facing a shortfall. A 20% cut in benefits would for people who don't receive that much off of it and who rely on it for a large or all a portion or a lot, all of their income, you know, a 20% cut would be really, really hard to take. That would be catastrophic for some people. So the, the hope is that Congress will, you know, do something to, uh, to, to, to deal with this funding shortfall. You know, to deal with the funding shortfall, either revenues have to go up or expenditures have to go down or some combination of the two. Um, one of the reasons that the whole working longer conversation comes into this is that the idea of working longer, you know, what if we just raised the uh, full retirement age to age 70? 
from age 67. What that would do is that would cut the cost of providing social security benefits, and that would go some way towards balancing the books. It would represent a, a rise in the full retirement age from age 67 to age 70 would represent about a 20% cut in benefits across the board, lifetime benefits for people. And it would fall most heavily on people who can't delay claiming and can't delay retirement. So, you know, I think Lisa and I, as we have looked at this, the um, policy options that we prefer because they would fall less heavily on the groups that can least afford it are solutions that look at ways to increase the revenues of social security through taxation, including potentially raising or lifting the um, payroll tax cap. So one thing that another thing that struck me is as quite startling um, in the book was this idea that when you wrote the book because there was this whole section of the population that really hadn't been kind of um, taken into account when doing all these calculations about later life and retirement. And those were the people in their 50s and early 60s that were already out of the workforce. So this, this was staggering to me that, that only about half had had steady employment all the way through their 50s. That, that was amazing to me. And so it made me think, wow, we need a much better lens to look at this population um, and see what their needs are. So, so what do we know about that whole section? You, you alluded to some of the reasons why people are out of the workforce. Um, and I mean by that, they're not even collecting unemployment. Sometimes they're just off the radar. That's right. So, who are these people? If you can give us just an idea. I mean, yeah. Obviously yeah, no, I appreciate you picking up on that. I think that's a really important part of what we've tried to get across in the book and a big motivation for the book. Um, the, the, the kind of conversation about how to, you know, encourage or motivate people to just, you know, keep working and delay retirement. Um, at least, a, you know, a portion of that conversation has tended to look at, okay, you know, what, what leads people to retire when they do? What you know, motivates people? Um, are there things that we can change policy-wise that would help people to work longer? A portion of that conversation really focused on people who were still in the labor force, still working in the kind of close run-up to retirement. You know, if they were still working at 62, if they were still working at 65, you know, what might persuade them to work another couple of years? The trouble is, of course, as you saw in some of those graphs earlier, is that if you limit yourself to looking at the needs of the people who are still in the labor force at 62 or 65, you're missing out all of these people who have already left the labor force, who are, have already left employment in their late 50s or early 60s. And that turns out to be, you know, a pretty big chunk of the population. And it's disproportionately disadvantaged. Um, so the, the gaps, the inequalities by education level are particularly striking. People with lower levels of education are much less likely to be able to, you know, sort of keep working into their 60s and to be able to delay retirement compared to people who have college degrees. And, you know, that makes sense because people who have college degrees are much more likely to have, you know, kind of the job kind of job that I have sitting right here, right, where um, I am not lifting things. I am not walking, you know, 20 miles a day in a warehouse. Um, so it's, you know, jobs that are, tend to be not physically demanding that tend to be interesting and likable and, you know, jobs that we want to continue doing for a long time and jobs that are more stable and secure and not designed to be kind of precarious high turnover jobs. Um, people with higher levels of education also tend to have better health. Um, so, you know, while one of the things we realized too doing the book is that having starting off with all the advantages doesn't guarantee that you will be able to um, 
delay retirement and work longer. Even people who start off with all the advantages can face a situation where they have a health crisis or a spouse or partner with a health crisis or where they get laid off from a job and can't find another one that meets their needs as well as the one they lost or where they have caregiving responsibilities for the older generation or the younger generation or both. So, you know, having all the advantages is not a guarantee but it certainly gives you a head start. So in terms of who are we missing out, we're disproportionately missing out people who are disadvantaged, but we're also missing out a lot of people who started off with lots of the advantages. So talking now about the workforce, um, I'm struck by quite a few things uh, that, that seem strange about the American experience, perhaps unique to the American experience. One is um, the number of people in that chapter dying with your boots on that are desperate. Older workers trying to do exactly the same things you're, you're saying, carry plates, go up and down stairs, work on conveyor belts, all these things that you, you could have done 20 years ago with no problem, and now you just can't. You just can't work that fast, that efficiently. It's just life. So there's a built-in redundancy into people's, like uh, they burn their engines out. Then there's the flip side. Today, there was a big article in the New York Times. Uh, all the campuses of the state university system in California went on strike today, the academic students, the, the graduate students. And one guy was interviewed, and he said he gets 2500 a month. This is a graduate student who's gone to school for a number of years, and half of that goes in rent. Now, that's pre-tax, 2500 a month. So this idea... Policymakers seem to live in some fantasy world that's not connected with talking to real people when they're making policy. This is not a slacker. This is a person who did everything right and they still can't pay their rent. And I think, you know, the, the number of people coming out on strike, this was a professional class, but I mean, the educated baristas that are now becoming union organizers. I mean, there's no kind of, I mean, you talk in the book about the German experience, for example, where there are labor organizations or negotiation organizations between the management and the workers that work. I worked in Germany and they do work really efficiently. So what happened to us? How did we end up with this almost feudal system for a lot of people where they're just working for the next paycheck, even graduate students today in California? So a couple of really important things about what you said right now. You, you mentioned the German experience, and part of what's in the book is this comparison of some of the institutions that operate in Germany versus the U.S. in terms of especially like worker voice, by which, you know, that's sort of jargon, but it just means like, how do workers influence their workplace and, you know, speak for what they need? And in the U.S., one of the major institutions for worker voice has long been labor unions. Labor unions have really disintegrated over the past few decades. Um, I think the statistics are, you know, a few decades ago, we would have had 35 percent of the private sector workforce um, as union members. And now we're down to perhaps six or seven percent. Um that's, you know, partly a policy choice in terms of, you know, laws that have changed that uh, make it harder to to unionize and to create union representation or worker voice. Um, in Germany, the institution of works councils um, gives uh, workers a voice in terms of how they want to operate and how they want to organize their their workforces and how they can negotiate with employers at not only just a sort of individual employer level, but at a sectoral level, you know, the level of a whole sector. So different countries definitely have different institutions that allow workers to have power and some measure of control over their work. And some of that's really been badly eroded in the US over the past decades. I think the other thing that you're pointing towards here is the question of like, what makes a good job? And, you know, what makes a job that would 
make working longer not only plausible, not only feasible, but also healthy for more Americans. And there, I think the answer is more complicated than I would have thought right at the beginning, too. One of the things that I learned is that, I mean, uh, you know, a good job involves, you know, fair pay, uh, you know, a healthy, safe workplace, let's say, you know, reasonable benefits and, you know, things like paid uh, sick leave, paid family and medical leave. You know, I think in some sense, you know, we know that those are characteristics of a good job. They are not as universal as one might wish, but, you know, let we can sort of take that for red at the moment. But there are also a lot of other char- characteristics that really matter to people in their jobs. And one of them is control, a sense of being able to, um, you know, control the pace and the timing of work. And here's where it's not only the low paid jobs that suffer in some way from these, from a lack of control. A lot, I mean, and they certainly do, especially jobs, you know, like retail jobs, restaurant jobs, where um, last minute scheduling is very common, where people might get their schedules with, you know, less than a day or two's notice. And the schedules are changing from day to day, from week to week. So they don't know how much they're going to make. You know, how do you begin to organize your life around a schedule that's constantly changing and is expecting you to be available all the time? You know, that kind of lack of control is very hard on people's health, on their finances. I think it's very much the kind of job that makes it hard to stay in the workforce, makes it hard to stay employed, makes it hard to work longer. But even good, you know, jobs that we might think of as good jobs, jobs that are well-paid, jobs that are, you know, steady and more secure can have these features that are, that make them really hard to stick with, you know, and one of those is this kind of 24-7 expectation that, you know, as technology has improved and, you know, the expectation that you're already always at the other end of your BlackBerry or your email or your phone or whatever, um, you know, to be available to your employer, to be available to clients, whatever. Um, that's also really hard on people. And, um, you know, there's quite a lot of evidence that suggests that if you can give people some control, and, you know, it's often very modest amounts of control over their schedule, over the timing and pace of their work, that that's better for people's health. It's better for retention. So it can be very helpful to companies. You know, those are the kinds of changes that we would need to see in addition to the big ones of, you know, fair pay and benefits. Those are the kinds of changes we'd need to see, I think, in order to make working longer a better option for more people. So someone's written in a question which corresponds very well with my next question. uh, So we can probably merge them. Someone said, do you know what percentage of employers are willing to have employees work beyond the traditional retirement age? It appears that ageism is the last acceptable ism. And then when you talk about that, um, Beth, I'd like you to talk about the aesthetic employment factor that you've talked about in the book, which is also amazing. The youthful Barton. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think we don't have any, you know, sort of good numbers that I know of to answer the question about, you know, what percent of employers for sure, age discrimination is ubiquitous. It is, it is, it is there. It is fierce. Um, there's some really good research um, from an economist at the Urban Institute that shows that. Um, so, two facts that I think are really striking. One is that even when you look at people who have like full time, full year jobs coming into their fifties about half of them will at some point in their 50s or early 60s experience what I think the researchers call an employer-related, I can't remember the phrase, anyway, get laid off and not fired for cause, you know, an employer-related job separation, I think that's what it is. So about half of people at some point lose their jobs in that in those years, even among people who had full-time, full-year jobs to start out with. Of people who lost their jobs, 
during those years, only one in 10 ever again had a job that paid as well as the one they lost. I'm going to repeat that because it is so startling every time. Only one in 10 ever again had a job that paid as well as the one they lost. Certainly among the reasons for that is age discrimination in hiring. It's There's really strong evidence of age discrimination in hiring that it's much higher, harder to get hired with the same set of qualifications if you are older than if you are middle-aged or younger. So that is absolutely real. Now you asked about aesthetic labor and I'm glad you did because I, I think this is a really striking piece. In this uh, chapter written by these sociologists about uh, restaurant workers, one of the things they talk about is this idea of aesthetic labor, which is basically looking the part. And they, as they've interviewed these restaurant workers, a lot of them talk about how they've been told by their employers that they look too old. And this is especially true for women, though it also hits men. Um, you know, that women, you know, even in like their 30s or 40s are being told that they look too old for the part. And so in restaurants, what this ends up meaning sometimes is that they're shifted from front of the housework to back of the housework. Now, front of the housework tends to be better paid. Back of the housework tends to be harder. It's less well paid. But, you know, if you're an older woman, that may be where you can get a job. So you keep working, you know, you may be working longer, but you're making less than you were when you were younger. So that whole thing of like, you know, do you look the part? It's it's a, a facet of age discrimination, um, especially for people who are in these kind of customer facing roles. I mean, you can imagine, you know, all of the retail stores in the mall that aren't going to hire somebody who's 55 to sell their close to teenagers. Yeah. I wonder how they actually talk about that in the interview, how they gloss over it, how they, what excuse they use. Um, or maybe they don't. What was the lovely expression you just said that they have? Something separation, employee separation. Employer-related job separation, I think. So yeah, um, for being like so a... Um, we got a couple more questions that have come in. Um, when people do make the decision to retire early, do they generally regret the decision or are they happy about it? That's a great question. Um, well, we had some feedback from people. Um, we asked this question uh, in a poll. The poll that people filled out was one question. Are you retiring early or late when they signed up for this? And I have to say, overwhelmingly, for a variety of pe- uh, reasons, people said they were retiring late. And it wasn't always because they wanted to. Um, I can read you some of them. One man was 75. Oh, one is 86, still trying to retire. One man said, I'm still working at 75. I endured a severe reduction in wages, just what you were saying, due to a hostile takeover when I tried to begin a new career. Um, The people that are enjoying it are people like psychologists who likes to work work part-time, grandchildren, trying to retire caught in the middle, um, taking care of people, working part-time, farming part-time. So, Quite a lot of people, late, late income, late. One person said, I love my job. Health and the need to maximize the retirement income, late. So, um, yeah, I I think we didn't hear so, we didn't hear as many people saying, I'm staying working, I love it, isn't it great? There were a few. Um, As you say, there were generally people that had autonomy, some kind of control of the hours they were working and they were doing it because they liked it, um, which is really not the vast majority of people that you were looking at um, when you were mm, putting this book together. So um, uh, I think it'd be interesting to read that book. I'm sure they're out there, people that are able to keep working and and enjoying it. And of course, health, your social situation vis-a-vis people you've got to take care of, enormous uh, impact on that. Because often you can have a very rewarding career, 
but it doesn't work when you have to do it half time because you're taking care of somebody. So then yeah. you have to pivot. And that's what you're saying. You're not likely to find something as highly paid again. Um, yeah. So you're going to be end up bagging at stop and shop, you know? So another in terms question. of the, I just wanted to chip in on, you know, you talking about sort of, you know, who enjoys their jobs as they get older, that too is more complicated and nuanced than I would have guessed at the start. You know, I would have guessed that, you know, professors enjoy their jobs and, you know, continue wanting to do them forever and ever. Um, but one of the things that also clearly came out in that chapter, dying with your boots on about the restaurant workers is how many of them really loved their work that they felt, you know, there was one in, uh, woman in there who'd spent her whole career being a restaurant server, and she really felt like it was a calling for her. Um, there's the bartender who talks about how much he loves his career. You know, he bartended in all these cool places in New York. Like, you know, he was obviously a real performer behind the bar. You know, these are people who really you know, they're not trying to get out of their job as fast as they can. They actually really enjoy what they do. But, in you know, it becomes really difficult to do because of the physical demands or because people won't hire them because they're old and what they look like or, you know, whatever is the reason that it becomes difficult to do that. So I think, you know, often people, you know, like aspects of their job, even if they don't like everything about it. And, you know, are proud of the work that they do, even if it's work that is, you know, low paid or difficult. Um, so I think, you know, there's there's a lot of, there's a lot more complexity to how people think about their jobs than we might think about it on the face of it. Um, and I think that's, that's really very, important as you're thinking about point. how yeah. people want to retire and not retire. The other sort of statistic that I want to chip in on that is that about half of Americans who are retired say that they were either forced or partly forced to retire. So a lot of people end up feeling that their timing of retirement was not their choice. Hmm. That's an interesting one. I wouldn't have thought that. Um, okay, there's another person. Actually, it's Miguel from Barcelona is joining us. To what extent does the education system encourage the value of vocation prior to choosing a profession and job? Gosh, that's an interesting question. Yeah. Um, the question of vocation. Um, it seems pretty split in America, doesn't it? You either choose a vocational school, certainly in Massachusetts, or you choose another school where you're kind of on path for college. They, they, that's the kind of split I've seen amongst the people I know. Um, it's a trade school or it's a school that you hope will segue into um, a college. But it's not done in the same way, again, as the German system, which is highly um, organized and, um, you know, like if you get an apprenticeship with Mercedes Benz, it's an amazing thing. Um, you know, they come to the school, you know, you're going to have a, a great career. Um, it's it's not seen as a kind of a substitute for college. It's another very worthwhile way to get qualified in an area and to make a good living. So in terms of what, you know, kind of vocational careers mean for, you know, work across the life course and for retirement, Um I interviewed a few years back some folks in the Carpenters Union in Boston. And one of the things that was so striking to me about that is the way that the trades unions were really easing the path towards retirement for their workers. So they were doing two things. One, they they were, you know, they had union pensions that kicked in at a much younger age than Social Security. So you could start claiming your union pension. Um, in your mid fifties. And many people did because, you know, I thought when I went to talk to them that it would be about physical job demands, but it wasn't really, it was, it wasn't about like, you know, lifting heavy things because modern pipes are not heavy. They're made of plastic. Um, it was things like, you know, there comes a point where you don't want to be standing out on a, you know, the 50th story of a building over Boston Harbor as the wind's coming in, trying to put the plumbing in, um, it, you know, these construction jobs. 
So union pensions were easing the path towards retirement, but then making it possible too for people to start drawing their pension and be able to continue to work as plumbers, but not out on the construction sites, more kind of in houses and in an environment that was a little bit friendlier. So I think, you know, when we when we look at people who have some college, which is where a lot of those trades qualifications would fit, they tend to be sort of in the middle of the educational gradient in terms of how long they work and things like this. But there are certainly features of some of those jobs that are union jobs that actually really help people towards a retirement that is more secure. Just a, a, a point before we look at some of the major conclusions you make um, in the book. Uh, one is this new group of people that probably no one's looking at yet, which is the group of gig workers that is a progressively growing group. Uh, people thinking, this is great. I can work from anywhere. I've got a lot of control or autonomy, usually no benefits, n- no sick time, never a pension. Uh, you know, if you're an Uber driver, what do they consider those to be independent contractors? Um, so this is a group of people that are going to suddenly come to this grinding halt, either through an injury or something changes dramatically in the economy, and they're going to have to find a new place. Maybe that's part of what you have to do now is to have three or four different particular skills that you juggle to just deal with the straight changing economy. Um, But this is something that I think is going to really jolt the system because those people probably aren't paying into the social security part. Yeah. People who are, people who are independent contractors are technically self-employed and, you know, they should be filing their taxes and they should be paying their social security through their taxes. Um, But it's absolutely true that they don't receive the same employment protections and benefits that somebody who's classified as an employee would. Um, The number of people who are working for like platforms in that that sort of gig work is still very small in the U.S. But I think the real concern is the sort of gigification of the economy, this, you know, making people independent contractors who perhaps really should be employees and therefore stripping away the employment protections that they have. And that those sorts of things, if that happens, that's going to make the approach to retirement harder for more people. So before we talk about the fight, the conclusions that you make in the book, which I think are so important, I just wanted to tell people that the book uh, even though it was written as an academic book, essentially it's a series of essays. Very, It's very readable. And if you can't afford it, we were just discussing this before the program, it's available on, was it Kindle? For about $17. Um, as it stands now, it's quite a hefty tome. It's a hardback. But if you go to your library, trust me, and suggest they order it, they probably will. And then you can get to read it and very many other people can read it too. So that's another way to to getting your hands on this book. So back to the book, because we're running out of time here. So Beth, you made uh, several conclusions, um, three that struck me. One, we talked about the change in policy so that more Social Security taxes are taken from high earners to move the cap on incomes uh, to enhance the coffers in Social Security. Um, Another was working longer is important, but it's an incomplete response to an aging population. And another was that we need to start way sooner in planning for the needs of older Americans, beginning with today's middle ages. Um, Is there another big point that that you want to reinforce? You know, I think the last two that you mentioned are really the most important for us. This idea that you really do need to be looking much earlier in the life course in terms of thinking about how people's jobs and lives actually unfold. I think this is something that, like we all know this at some level, right? The things that happen to you earlier in your life affect what happens to you and the job, the options and the opportunities that you have later in life. And I think the more that we can design policy with that in mind, which means making investments now that will pay off in 10 or 20 years, which is hard to do, it's long-term, but 
the more we can do that, the better prepared the upcoming generations will be for retirement. So lobby your state representatives and your senators on this topic, because some of them probably don't know these statistics. Okay, Beth, uh, the time has flown by. Um, I really want to thank you for this uh, wonderfully enlightening conversation about a very important uh, topic that we all have to consider sooner or later, retiring or working longer. Um, so kudos to, uh, to you about the book and staying up so late for us in Northern Ireland to take part. Appreciate that. So Cambridge Forum is made possible through the generosity of Herbert and Dorothy Vetter, the Lowell Institute, Mass Cultural Council, Cambridge Community Foundation, and of course, you. So please don't feel shy about donating. And you can sign up to our list, uh, regardless of donation, on the website, www.cambridgeforum.org. And there you'll find a podcast of this program shortly and many other forums, as well as video links to past programs and access to a lot of digital recordings. So thank you very much, Beth, and to everyone that joined us, and I'll see you all again soon. Bye.